Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Trader Merlin Show. It is your Tuesday edition, an exciting Tuesday. We'll call it Fed Tuesday. We're going to have Bill Addis joining us on the program here in just a little bit. For those of you who don't know who Bill Addis is, I call him my resident bond market expert. He's worked for a lot of the major financial firms that you may know and love or hate and despise, depending on your perspective of the financial markets. Uh, but Bill is uh, one of the bond resident experts. We'll talk about the Fed. The topic today is really fighting the Fed, which, of course, I think most of us realize is a fool's errand. And the Fed has definitely stepped up their game a little bit with regards to what they intend on doing to keep this market continually, perpetually going higher. So that'll be our focus of discussion today. If you have any questions for Bill, let us know. Of course, if you guys are new to the show, as I know we have some new followers, click that subscribe button down below. That way you'll be notified when we do our live broadcast at 2 p.m. every day. Plus, I release a video on Saturday called The Chart of the Week. And then Tilly Allison is now doing a program which is called Tilly Market Outlook, which I release on Sunday afternoon. Hello, Batista, Fabiano, Brendan, Sean, Yvesy. Uh, Gaier, Tomasina, Dave, yes, Dave Stewart with the, you like that Who song, huh? Kind of a weird one. I, I didn't think I would like it, but the, the it's Mongolian Throat Singers Heavy Metal Band, which I thought was really kind of weird. Of course, you're a Dave Matthews Band fan, so you kind of go down a couple of pegs. Uh, the, the Fish is a, is a way better band than Dave Matthews, but anyway, we won't go into the music show today. Let's go into a financial market show. I'll start you things off with our market update here, talking about El Crudo. Crude oil was the first one we're going to take a peek at. This is your CL chart right now, and if you look at um, on the the day, you're down 0.79% for crude oil. So it wasn't uh, you know anything overly dramatic. It tiptoed across that $40 mark as we mentioned on previous shows, and came right back down. So still no breakout on crude oil. Stuck to the ceiling. It's like the helium balloon. You're just like just either go up or stick. Come down. That's crude oil. All right, here's your gold chart, down 0.18%. Um, it actually, why does my GC look so weird? That, is, that does look odd. Uh, probably after hours session and the rollover to the new session. Uh, showing is down 0.18, 1763 is where it's at right now. It actually closed on this daily at 1783. So it's down 20 bucks in the after hours session here. Um, but that's what the numbers you're seeing. And it's still basically middle of the range, no big deal for gold at this point. Russell 2000 uh, starts off our indexes at the negative note. Most of them were up today. You're up negative for the Russell 2000, which finished the day at 1431. Right now it's 14 or 1431 right now as we speak on the live market. And that was your number five. Ten year, I'm not interested in that one yet. We will go up here to the S&P 500, which has this long topping tail, long bottoming tail, and just really indecision today, which, um, you know, some of the economic data out there, we had positive stuff, we had some negative stuff as well, so I think it all balanced out to people going, where the hell is this market going to go? They just don't know at this point. So you had pretty much unchanged, 0.04% move positive for the S&P 500 to 3112. NASDAQ, of course, continuing on with its wonderful lead to all-time highs. Today, you had a, a breakthrough to all-time highs yet again. Why does this chart look so darn weird to me? Um, I don't This just feels really, really awkward. This chart looks so bizarre to me right now. Okay. Um, it feels almost like it's condensed into a weekly, but the, apparently, let me, let me change this to see if I can do this to a weekly and then go back to a daily. Huh. All right. Well, that's what we got. Okay. Uh, NASDAQ 0.07% move to the upside, but that was your second place finisher. First place brings us to Bitcoin, which as we talked about yesterday, going to try to creep towards that $10,000 mark. That is definitely that line in the sand for Bitcoin. And we are at 9,640 as we speak, actually 650. And that is again, a 0.57%. Okay. Uh, for today, as you guys know, we've uh, had our this guest that's going to be on on the program before, and I actually thought it would be kind of interesting to to have him on again after the Fed has made a bunch of mm, not going to say bizarre announcements, but just a bunch of announcements which put them into arena that I haven't seen them in, and that is really the topic of the day is me fighting the Fed, and we've got Bill Addis with us today, of course. Uh, what is, I don't know why Skype always decides to give me issues when Bill is on the program. How you doing, Bill? You there? <laughs> well, I can hear you. Can you hear me, Merlin? I got you loud and clear. Well, uh, oops. Uh, well, I got you loud and clear. Um, topic today is fighting the Fed. I know that you're uh, someone who's been around the Fed for a very, 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 very long period of time. Wise choice <laughs> or uh, are, are we okay to fight the Fed every now and again? Um, you can fight the Fed to the same extent you can stand in front of a locomotive. You know, it's kind of uh, going to run you over one way or the other. But mm -hmm. uh, yeah, the Fed is certainly taking unparalleled action here. So it's been fascinating to watch, hasn't it? It has been. It's it's a little scary because I don't know, I don't know the impacts of what they're doing. And you know, if you look back to when we started doing quantitative easing, this was something that in the U.S. hadn't been done. Um, unfortunately, that's just 
<laughs> I love Skype with Bill. It's all, it only happens with you, Bill, that weird little beep beep it disconnect. Does. Um, you yeah. know, you go, you go I'm back. back. I'm here. You're here. <laughs> I, I can see when you're here. Uh, you go back to quantitative easing, and that was something that was unprecedented for the United States. We saw Japan do it, which didn't really help them out, but we did quantitative easing, and that was an unknown. And there's a lot more unknowns. Um, Tell me this. Do you think the Fed at this point is overstepping its boundaries because it's it's backstopping uh, the treasury market? It's backstopping corporate debt. It's backstopping mortgage-backed securities. All these markets that normally wouldn't need their intervention, the Fed just basically saying, you, you none of you shall fall. Yeah. No, I, um, I, I want to know when it became the Fed mandate to bail out corporate America. Um, you know, the, the Fed is taking such, and I'm getting tired of using the word unprecedented, but everything is yeah, unprecedented right. these days. Um, but when you look at their entree, particularly into the corporate bond area and the muni area, you know, the, the stimulus package of 2020 addresses money for both municipalities and the high yield and corporate bond market. That's new for the Fed. Yeah. And I really do think it's the Fed telegraphing to us. That's where they see the problems are going to be. You know, I think they're kind of showing their hand. They're addressing high yield corporates and munis because I think that's where the real fallout is going to be. I think we can take a lesson from them. So you said that's the real fallout is going to be. De de define your term of fallout because I think as someone who's been in this market a lot longer than I have, you've seen more of these roller coaster rides and what the, the quote unquote fallout might be. Cause, Cause somebody might be just joining the show. Fallout could be apocalyptic, you know, and, and the markets just completely crumble and we turn into a third world country again. I think that's extreme, but some people might not know what fallout means. So what do you, what would be your dis definition of fallout in that respect? Yeah, no, that's, that's a good question. And by, and by fallout, I mean a major repricing. You know, it, it, let's look at the high yield market for a moment. And by the way, you know, I have to put give you kudos that that program you did last Saturday on the corporate bond and high yield market, I thought was excellent. Oh, thank you. But this market is changing so quickly in just the last two weeks. We've got even more stuff going on. Mm -hmm. um, but but fallout to me and let, let's just focus on high yield for a moment it is a major repricing. And, you know, if, if you look at those charts that, that we were talking about and preparing, um, if you look at that one chart and uh, with our. Uh oh, you disappeared on me. We're gonna have these odd oh, little spread. little. Uh, there you go. You're you're back. Go ahead. Okay. If you look at the chart, the <laughs> right as you get to the meat, uh, Bill, it cuts Bill you out. Between treasure. What's that? You, you go ahead. It keeps cutting off on you. I'm not sure what's going on there, but Shh. I'm sorry. Well, excuse me. I'm sorry, Marlon. Sorry. That's okay. Um. The credit spreads is, is the yield premium that you get for a corporate bond over its comparable treasury. And what that bottom chart shows is back in 09, those credit spreads in the crisis blew out to over a thousand basis points, meaning 10, meaning 10 percent more yield. And when this crisis started in 09, you can see those spreads started widening out again. But they've come down quite a bit. And, mm -hmm. and quite frankly, that concerns me. I worry that that's a head fake. Because we've got a huge amount of high yield paper due to come into the market, right? So you, so all the sorry, high. I I, I'm sorry, I was re reloading. So, for example, um, you know, if you look in just this year alone, we've had names like Delta, Ford, Macy's have all dropped from investment grade into junk because you know we keep talking about this big um, balloon of bonds that are sitting at that BAA rated category. And that's the only notch above high yield before if you get downgraded, you turn into junk. And we're starting to see that deterioration of names going from investment grade down into the junk world. I mean, big ones, Ford, Macy's, Delta, mm -hmm. have all dropped into the junk category. So there's a huge amount of potential supply. Uh, however, if you look though, the credit spreads on the high yield paper has actually narrowed and that's counterintuitive to me. And I forgive me, and I'm giving opinion here, but I think that that relationship is very similar to the equity markets, where we're seeing a, an enthusiasm that I personally don't quite understand. With this huge, because let's face it, and, and here's my bias, the Fed is throwing everything against the wall they can to try and prop up the markets. But bottom line, the Fed can't cure the virus. The Fed can't give us a a vaccine. The Fed can't make people put their masks on. So, you know, if you do feel... Uh-oh.
you know, all, all this paper potentially being downgraded. On the positive side, though, you've got the Fed in buying. You know, the Fed has announced that they're going to do a $750 billion corporate bond buying program. $750 billion. I mean, that's a nice piece of change in a product they never bought before. Right. And they're specifically going to be targeting junk bonds in that. And, and the thing that I only found out this week in doing some research is that the Treasury Department is actually giving the Fed a backstop. The Treasury Department has offered to take, if they have a loss on these trades, buying all these bonds, the Treasury Department, your taxes and mine, are going to take $75 billion of the first losses. The Treasury has given the Fed a backstop here. I've never seen that before. So it, it, it's bizarre because to me what we have is you have a situation where the Fed is entering into a market where it really shouldn't be, which is completely interfering with the free market. Now, we know they have, a man, they have their mandate and all that, but they're, they're out there backstopping mortgage-backed securities, uh, municipalities, now corporate bonds. And in doing so, it's basically like saying, here's an individual who is doing something they shouldn't be doing, but then another entity, part of our government, is saying, if you do what you're not supposed to do, which is what you're going to do anyway, and go do that, right. if that fails, we will bail you out with the taxpayer's money. And it, to me, it just seems kind of convoluted and, and, and wrong to do so. Of course, I don't have a say in the matter. It's just the way that it is. Do you see any um, unintended consequences of kind of this dual faction of the Fed and the Treasury kind of back, patting each other's backs? I mean, it's, it's nice to see them working together, I guess. I mean, we certainly have a common goal. But I've never seen this type of a relationship where the Fed's going to come into the market, they're going to be buying assets. I mean, imagine yourself as a trader where you've got somebody right willing to uh, take on your trading losses. That's not a bad situation to have. I and I don't really understand the reason for it because the Fed has a trading desk in New York. And the truth is they've got a good trading desk. You know, if you look at the Fed's interventions back in 2009 when they were coming in and buying at the bottom, basically, you know, the Fed's made a good amount of money off their trading operations. Yeah. Uh, the Fed is a very profitable trading desk, and I think their opportunity here, I'm surprised the Treasury had to come in and backstop them for $75 billion. Bill, you, you threw that one out there, and i got to just run with it. Um, in looking at some of the things that they have done, not only are they profitable, but they're making unbelievable amounts of profit. And, and that profit, it's almost like a – if I was to do an analogy here, it would be the same thing as um, – let's just say Lehman Brothers since they can't sue me because they're out of business. Let's say Lehman <laughs> Brothers issues a bond, right? And they decide to sell this bond and they pump it up and they do everything to get the public to buy it, but nobody wants to buy it. So they go out and they convince uh, the government to help bail them out because, oh, well, it's dangerous to our company. We need to have you buy this. So they, they back them up and try, to, and try to buy all these bonds. Then they take out more mortgages and loans and they buy those bonds with it to help prop up that market and then it just continues to be inflated artificially. And that's the impression I'm getting here. And I can see some questions coming in from the audience. You know, uh, one said, Bill says, um, Brennan says, Bill, can the Fed fake money print replace, uh, fake money printing replace real production? And does the Fed have any constitutional bias to exist at all? Oh, right as he goes to answer the question, too. I know. Can you repeat the question? I'm sorry. Just as you started to read the question. Yeah, no problem. Uh, there, there, were, there was uh, number one, number two was, does the Fed have any constitutional basis to exist? Now, they were formed after the Constitution, so technically, no. No, it's not constitutional, but there is the legislation is the Federal Reserve Act of 1913. Yep. That is the legislative act that created the Fed as we know it today. So, no, there's no constitution. Yeah. Yeah, and, and, and certainly, I mean, who knows? You may get an amendment at some point, the way that things are going. But uh, right now, no, there is not a constitutional anything to have the Fed allowed in there. What about um, the second no, question? See, uh, I'm sorry, I jumped back in, Merlin. I'm sorry. Yeah, there's a Congressional Act, the Legislative Act, the Federal Reserve Act of 1913 is what created the Fed. So it's not constitutional, but it is legislatively right. mandated. Um, the other question he had was, does the Fed's fake money printing replace any real production? Do you see that damaging the, the actual production numbers or... Production in terms of industrial production. I'm, I'm assuming he means like GDP type of production. Is that right, Brendan? Uh, yeah. I'll take a second. Um, I mean, the, go the goal of this, you know, of what the Fed is doing, and, and I, I'm going to tangent this with an observation you made right before we started taking questions as to how this is working. Because what we're already seeing is junk bond companies are already starting to take advantage of this. 
you know, with with the Fed stepping in and credit spreads tightening a little bit because you've got the Fed in there as a buyer, we've now got junk companies are coming to market to issue more debt. You know, just this week alone, we had Spirit Airlines. I mean, you got you to be pretty bad daring to uh, issue an airline bond in this market. But Spirit Airlines and Burlington Coat and a bunch of others, we, we've got about a trillion dollars worth of high yield debt look like it's going to come to market here very soon. Mm -hmm. So the issuers, the junk issuers are saying, OK, with the Fed in there and the Fed buying paper and the credit spreads narrowing, this might be a good time to issue bonds. I'm not sure these co companies can afford this leverage. I agree. I think uh, it, it's it, there's a certain point where they won't be able to support it all. And of course, we know that uh, um, that there's no limit. That's a question that comes in from AVP. He says, will there be a cap on how much they can buy? Uh, what if market makers decide to sell? And, and that's the cap issue is the one that bothers me. And I, and I thank you for that question, because whenever the Fed did quantitative easing in the past, you know, 2009 through 2013, it was for a quantifiable definitive amount. We knew how much the Fed was buying. Well, Powell gave himself an unlimited checkbook back in March. Mm -hmm. He literally said, we'll do as much as is necessary. And we've talked about, you know, and shown the visuals of the Fed's balance sheet now exploded to over $7.2 he, He's a man of his word. He'll, he'll just go out there and start buying. And the fact that it's an unlimited checkbook, I worry about anybody, including the Fed, with an unlimited checkbook. You give me an unlimited overdraft, I'm going to use it. Um, and I worry the Fed is doing the same thing. I agree. Um, you know, and you know we can get arguments from both sides. One of the arguments would be, hey, look, they're doing a good thing because they're keeping the economy rolling. But I think most of this audience, anyway, would agree that if you are, if you're, in a, if you have a medical condition and you're taking meds to help with that medical condition, at a certain point, you're going to be healed of whatever ailment, and you don't need the med, the meds anymore. And we are at this point just addicted straight to the Fed for. For many 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 years uh, it's been kind of interesting because when i first started trading it wasn't this big dependency on the fed they were there as a market factor but it wasn't just hey anything goes wrong let's just look at the fed because they're going to bail us out um yep. that seems to be growing um and i think it's going to be even more significant going forward walk us through um on the, the corporate debt piece you sent in a, a a chart which it had a table below it um there were actually two there but i, I think if we look at this the table is very telling, which talks about the global corporate default summary. Um, yes. America, again, center stage here, taking the lead as far <laughs> as uh, potential defaults. But what does this mean to you? Well, and it's really a, 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 a um, comparative issue. And, you know, the, the rest of the world's going to do what the rest of the world does. And obviously, we're 40% we're of the world's economy, so we should be a big number there. Mm -hmm. But the number out of that chart at the bottom that scares me is already year to date, we've had 58 fallen angels. You know, I just mentioned three, Delta, Ford, and Macy's. But in the first four months, five months of this year, we've had 58 downgrades into the junk category. That's almost comp comparable to what happened all of last year. Right. So, you know, th what I what scares me about this chart or the sobering aspect of this chart is, you know, this is not a theoretical discussion of these downgrades. This is happening. Yeah. And, and I just remain convinced that the high yield market is still running on that adrenaline of Fed intervention. You know, everyone's you, you watch the talking heads on TV and everyone wants to see more Fed intervention and more Fed, more Fed buying this, buying that. I, I still don't understand when it became the Fed's job to prop up markets. By printing money to buy assets. I just have a fundamental problem with it. There's my fight with the Fed. <laughs> yeah, no, and I, I'm with you. You know, and they've got, there, there's so many other areas that we have issues on, but obviously the Fed thinking they can backstop them all. Um, looking at the amount of companies being downgraded it is, is surprising. I think I read something in March or um, I think it was March, Goldman Sachs said they expected over $500 billion of um, triple, not triple A, but uh, um, High yield corporate debt to be downgraded to speculative debt, which would be going to triple yeah, B and lower. Um, exactly. And, and that's, you know, $500 billion is no, you know, small little amount. That's a pretty significant chunk. And that was back several months. I think now we'll probably see that number increase even more given the speculative nature or the economic problems that some of these companies are having. Um, I agree with you 100%. And that's why the fact that these credit spreads in the high yield sector are narrowing, um, I think is a bit of a head fake. I, mm -hmm. I think there's a cautionary note to be had here. I really do. All right, now I'm going to go into conspiracy theory crap just because I, I can. Um, in the movie The Big Short, it kind of came out that the ratings agencies were 
just as villainous and deceptive and lying to the public with regards to their ratings. Now, if we know pretty clearly that if there's a whole shift from AAA, all of a sudden it gets downgraded aggressively and you're looking at now it's speculative junk bond material, that this could be you know, the piece that chops off America at the knees and all of a sudden we, we go down significantly. To what extent do you trust these ratings agencies, Moody's, Fitch, S&P, to be honest and forthcoming in these announcements? Because for me, I feel like if I'm the government, I'm, I'm going into these agencies, I'm having a board meeting and saying, hey, listen, jerks, if you guys do one freaking thing to downgrade some of this corporate debt, I will rain hellfire down upon your companies <laughs> and make your lives a living hell. And I'm, if I'm S&P and Moody, I'm going to go, hey, boss, you just tell me what you want me to do. And I know that that's extreme. But gosh, after watching some of these shows, I really feel like that is a potential here. Do you trust the ratings agencies at this point? No. And in the interest <laughs> of full disclosure, I, I have to say both Fitch and Moody's are clients of mine. So I, I work with both Fitch and Moody's. So, so basically you're unemployed any... as of tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, right. Exactly. Um, I, maybe I used to be employed by Fitch and Moody's. But I, I'm free to say this in the classrooms I do with them. No, I, I, I have a huge problem with the rating agencies. And, and I, I honestly don't ascribe it to malicious intent. Right. But I do think the very business model by which we rate bonds is just problematic. You know, I, I think the fact that the issuer pays for the rating, I think that we can shop the rating to different agencies to see who'll give us better treatment. You know, if I don't mm -hmm. like what S&P says on a shadow rating, I'll go check out Moody's. Yeah. You know, and to me, that's very similar to what uh, I know realtors do the, a similar thing where a realtor. Um, We're going back to the big short. You know, right. I, I have to even agree with you. If you remember the one scene where Steve Carell was talking to the woman from Fitch? sitting in her office and she was wearing blinders. How was that for a visualization? <laughs> and, and Steve was just haranguing her, you know, how could you rate these bonds investment grade? We all know they're crap and junk and blah, blah, blah. And finally in disgust, she threw down her pen and said, you want to know why I rated them double A? Because if I didn't, they just would have taken their business and walked it down the street to Moody's where they would have gotten a double A. Exactly. And you know, there's some competitive pressures there that we have to admit. So I've got a problem. I think the very business model is broken and my concern is Congress oversees this. You know, these companies are called agencies because they're certified by Congress to give us these ratings. We've got eight companies, Moody's, S&P, Fitch, Best, Dun & Bradstreet, all in the same business. Mm -hmm. And Congress has chosen to do absolutely nothing about it. They know that there's a problem here, but it's just not on their radar screen. So the only thing I can say is, and I'm not comfortable with this, I hope we've learned our lessons from 2009 where maybe the bond buyers have gotten a little smarter. They're actually reading the indentures, you know, the institutional market and retail. And I hope the rating agencies themselves have gotten a little smarter. But systemically, the system is exactly the same as it was back in 09. Literally nothing has changed systemically. Right. You know, and it, it, for me, and, you, and you've done a lot of talk on this program about bonds and building bond ladders and barbells and those types of strategies. For me, it fundamentally changes the way that I would look at those positions. So. You know, if I'm looking at, uh, you know, building a, a bond ladder or something and I can and I say, okay, I got to stay with, um, you know, the, the high grade stuff, I'm no longer going to be even thinking about triple B because to me that's already in junk. I'm no longer yeah, be thinking double A because even though that's corporate, you know, high, high grade, to me, I, I almost feel like I should take whatever rating an agency gives it and drop it one notch or two and say that's more realistic. I mean, it just seems so weird to me. And if I'm if I'm if I need to be a risk averse investor or really make sure I'm, I watch my capital, if I'm a I've got a big bucket of, of wealth I'm trying to manage, I can't take on that extra risk, even though they might be rated double A. My guess is they're probably closer to junk at this point. I, I think of that caution. You know, I think in the back of your mind or the front of your mind. In today's world, you really have to keep that cautionary note. I, I do agree with you. I think the ratings are, are aggressive. I really do. I share that concern. I really do. I, I am very frustrated personally. i got to get a life, the fact that I'm frustrated by it. No, but the fact you that should the, be. Nothing has changed from 2009, and we know there's a problem. I mean, the rating agencies have to take a big accountability to the crisis in 2009. And, and systemically, nothing is different today. I find that very frustrating. I, I as well. I find it very frustrating. Uh, Kaplan says, what's the downside to the Fed's actions and what are the warning signs to look out for as traders? Now, obviously, um, 
you can't just flood a market with this much money and support every business without there being some ramification. There is some part part here that could lead to fallout. What, what do you see as being part of the potential fallout from this? Well, again, I, I think the fallout is that, that potential repricing that I really strongly believe is coming down the road. Um, you know, I, I, I hate the word bubble. I really do. But I feel like every class I give, I start off by saying I hate the word bubble and then I use the word bubble. But, you know, I, I will equate what's going on in the high yield market to what's going on in the equity market. You know, I personally, I, I can't equate 13 million people unemployed this month and the market hitting record highs. I, I think the market is acting on, a, on an addiction and I think it's an addiction to the liquidity the Fed is bringing. Mm -hmm. You know, we're just forget forget helicopter Ben. This is Avalanche Powell. He's just you know, he's just creating an avalanche of money into the economy. Yeah. And I think the markets are reacting to that. So I, I firmly believe and I'll stick with bonds, which is my forte. I shouldn't even go into equities. But I think in the high yield market, there is a repricing coming that we're gonna go back to levels close to what we saw in two thousand and nine because I firmly believe the economy is gonna be worse than is or gonna be worse than oh nine. Yeah, I, I I tend to agree, which is why I have my short position on. And uh, Chris right. says, does Bill suggest going to cash? No, I'm not. I'm pretty sure Gil, Bill's not saying go to cash. It's just I think I think like we would look at any investment, you take it with a grain of salt. I think equities are probably a little easier because everybody has access to a specific share of a company. We can do our own analysis as to the health of that company, looking at the balance sheets and fundamentals. The difficult part here is to take an even bigger step and say, what is the financial well-being of these uh, issuers of bonds, right? So we rely on the credit reporting agencies, just like you and I have a credit score that uh, you know FICO puts together and, and Experian or Equifax, they put together these scores. Again, we have to trust them on those numbers. Now, I've done everything in my power to boost my credit score. I finally peaked out at 850, pretty damn happy about that. Yeah. But we have to now take these rating agencies' words that these these bond products, which many people are using in their long-term investments, are as safe as they are saying they are. And I believe, personally, that they're inflating things a little bit. I, I find it hard-pressed to believe that a rating agency uh, would rate something lower than it actually was, unless maybe they were paid to do so. So No, no you're right. Yeah, the bias I, is to the upside. The bias is to overrate, yes. not to underrate. Right. And you know, and, and the fact that you could you could pay an agency to upgrade your stock or give maybe give you some preferential treatment should make you already think you know uh, ill about the entire rating process. But yep. you know, it's a necessary evil. Uh, unfortunately, it's just the way that things are right now. It's like Ticketmaster. I don't like them, but I still got to buy tickets to my favorite shows and I got to go through Ticketmaster. <laughs> yep. Yeah, and, and even worse, our fiduciary laws are based on these ratings, yeah. and we know the system is broken. You know, your definition of fiduciary responsibility is based on ratings, and we know it's broken. <sighs> That's nuts. Um, Bill, tell me about, uh, I know you were talking about a, a class coming up here. I know you were doing something, a, a Fed class, which I thought was rather interesting, but you've got some classes. How can our viewers uh, maybe attend some of these classes? Yeah, no, it's um, my client base is very fortunately keeping me busy. My life has moved on to Zoom, so I never have to leave home, but I'm traveling all over the world again. Um, yeah, and I was very fortunate to do a class at the Fed this week, so that was kind of fun. I'll do another one in July and another one in August, so that's been fun. But yeah, it were, it's preliminary, but I think we can kind of start talking about it. I am working with OTA to put together a three-day, let's call it a signature series, where we can get me either out on the road or virtually to begin with and then out on the road offering a series of classes on the economy, fixed income, kind of something different from the traditional OTA classroom situation. And it's a, called a signature series. There's been a couple of them going on. So I'm working with them now on putting that together. I'm really looking forward to doing more with OTA. Yeah, I am as well. We've been talking about, you know, we're getting a bond class with you for quite some time. So good to yeah. see uh, Signature Series come in. So for those that don't know, Signature Series are more individual specific. So if it's the, the Brandon Wendell or the Bob Dunn Signature Series, you're getting more a flavor of their style and how they would approach these markets. Of course, OT really hasn't done much with bonds over the years. We've done a lot with Strategic Investor, which incorporates bonds, but having something that's dedicated to um, bond products and, and treasuries, those types of markets are, are very powerful. And especially once you start to learn uh, the different strategies and tactics for them. You know, I, it was great doing the videos that we did, uh, Bill, with 
bond ladders and barbells. If you guys like to know more, if you go to otacademy.com, there are a lot of videos that Bill and I recorded on different bond market structures, different treasuries, uh, how the Fed funds work, all that stuff. So if you want more information there, that's all free available to you. I think you just have to sign up. Um, AVP says, any thoughts about GDP projection? I don't know if that's in your, your realm of purview. Are you a GDP follower? Not not really. I, and, you know, I, I follow it on a reactive basis, not getting in front of the number, but you know, it's it's pretty obvious that we're looking at, at a negative number. It's just a matter of how negative. Mm -hmm. But you know, down five percent is kind of what the uh, IMF is calling for. What was it? Five point eight percent, I think. Um, I, I'm not a GDP follower per se. I, I don't want to misrepresent, but it's not going to be pretty. Yeah, I, I don't it think it's going to be. Matter. I don't think it's going to be pretty. And I think you know we've had. Um, you know, such a, a huge drawdown of what's been going on in the economy. Obviously, there's going to be a big decline in it. Now, the question that everyone's going to be wanting to to know is, you know, how quickly do we bounce back from this? And I'm actually pulling up. Uh, give me just a second here. I can pull up that GDP number. I should be able to get it. I got the UK one. Um, but you know, ours ours was not good. And the the question again is, how quickly do we rebound and how quickly can we get back on our feet? Because the U.S. GDP number was pretty. Abysmal. Um, I don't see it all of a sudden getting back into the positive territory where it was, but no. uh, you know, I think it's safe to say this was an aggressive knee-jerk reaction. I don't know if the fallout is done. I think we're going to probably see a little bit of dip here in early July as we get into Q2 earnings. But again, that's been my stance for the better part of the past couple of months. And I don't know. I don't think I don't think we're out of the woods yet with GDP. I share that. I share that with you. There, there is one thing I want to kind of just tease you, your your listeners on in a bit. Um, Maybe the next time we get together, one of the things that is really going to, I think, be in play is the yield curve itself. You know, going back to the Treasury market, mm -hmm. we got, you know, we've got it looks like now a four trillion dollar deficit this year. So that's four trillion dollars worth of more bonds the government's going to have to issue to pay for that deficit. And the Fed has already told us they're going to do it in the long end of the marketplace. So that's going to mean a real shift to the yield curve. You know, the Fed's not going to be raising rates. So the short end of the market is pretty much going to stay at zero. Right, right. But with this boatload, I mean, we've got a huge amount of supply coming in for the rest of the year to finance this deficit. I, I, I really think the yield curve is going to be doing a major shift up. So many people might know that we've talked about it briefly in, at OTA on the steepener trade. Mm -hmm. I think there's some real opportunities coming down the pipeline there. Explain that a little bit. Just walk, talk about the steepener trade just so the viewers that may not have been here can understand kind of what, what you're yeah. talking about. Sure. Um, just, just very briefly, if you look at the yield available on all the treasuries, you know, they range from three mo one month out to 30 years. The yield differentials right now are very narrow. You know, we have a pretty flat yield curve. You know, for example, right now, the 10-year treasury is yielding 0.71. That's the yield on the 10-year treasury. The yield on the 30-year treasury is 1.5. So that's a 79 basis point differential right now between the 10 year and the 30 year. And what we're saying is just given supply and demand considerations, long term interest rates should be going higher. That yield differential should widen. Mm -hmm. The yield on the 30 year should get much wider than the 10 year, the higher than the 10 year. So the way you would trade that is you would go short the 30 year futures contract because you want that yield to go up, price to go down and you would buy the 10-year. In other words, you're locking in the yield differential between the 10-year and the 30-year. You're not making an absolute play on interest rates absolutely because if interest rates go up or down linear, you're not gonna make or lose money. You're just gonna make money on the yield differ or lose money on the yield differential. Does that make sense? Yep. I'm kind of speed talking here, I'm sorry. No, it's okay, we, it's a good thing, we like it. Yes, so I, like many people, really do believe that longer rates are gonna be going higher, that yield curve is gonna get steeper and there's an interesting trading opportunity there because it's a bit more conservative than just an outright trade. You know, you're not going long or short one position. You're doing a spread trade, so that mitigates some of the risk. And I like that trade. Yeah, you know, it's one of those ones that uh, I think most people don't quite understand it or know all the mechanics of it. So it's nice for you to explain it out there. Um, let me show you one last chart here, everybody. This is the the GDP numbers we were just mentioning, and this is the forward GP. So this is this them oh, giving estimates as far as where they think things are gonna be headed. And I thought you might like this one because we really haven't seen much in the way of negative markets here for GDP. But if you look at the um, the the drop back in 2009, we just briefly tiptoed down below negative six percent. Well, the most recent reading, which came out a month ago, is showing negative five percent. 
So right. you know, for me, that that's pretty critical to pay attention to and how quickly this bounces back. You notice this is obviously in quarters. So it didn't take too long. We were basically had negative GDP for a year uh, from second or third quarter of 2008 all the way through second quarter of 2009. Right now, we went from uh, a 2% GDP to all of a sudden negative five in one quarter. So that is obviously a dramatic swing out there with regards to GDP. We'll see what the next number reports and how that one comes out. So it's uh, hopefully it won't be as bad as expected, but you just never, never know. I right, wanted to share that one with you. All Good. right, Bill. Thank you, Bill. Yeah. Um, well, cool. Well, thank you so much for coming on. I know you, uh, you're a busy, busy guy. I know you're teaching all next week. It's 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 an honor to have somebody who's teaching for the Fed, teaching the Fed at the Fed. That's kind of an interesting one. Um, thank you so much for coming on. And, and let me know when you come closer to announcing the actual, like your first date to do your signature series. Uh, I would like to be a part of that. And I'm sure some of our viewers would as well. So I'd love to, to be a part Promise of that you, one. you'll be the first to know. I look forward to it. You've been a big supporter, Marlon. We appreciate, I appreciate it. Thank oh, you. My, my pleasure. All right, Bill. Thanks so much. Take care. Uh, have a fantastic, is it, it's Tuesday. I was going to say have a fantastic week weekend but it's taco tuesday so hopefully you got some tacos there you go. out there on the east coast safe week to all, all be, right, so, be healthy be safe all right take care bye, -bye. cheers all right guys that was bill Addis. um i'll let you know more about his upcoming class i think that's gonna be a really interesting one uh, just just diving much deeper into a lot of the stuff you know when he comes on here we get kind of a high level sprinkling of information from a wide variety of interesting topics i hope you enjoyed that one if you did go ahead and give me a like out there a little thumbs up on uh, youtube channel always helps um, I do have a couple minutes left, so I want to make sure I get to a listener question. Um, teaching the Fed to avoid the stuff that they're going to do. Yeah, right. <laughs> well, what's interesting, I, that comment I thought was kind of interesting that he says he doesn't trust the rating agencies, yet he's teaching classes for the rating agencies. It's like, ooh, uh, it might not bode so well for your employment future there, but hey, got to love a straight shooter. Um, there was a question that came through I wanted to get to from CG. And I meant to get to this one yesterday, but I just didn't have time to do it, so uh, I will do it today. CG asks, if you could go back in time knowing what you know now, is there anything that you would tell yourself about trading to be aware of or to care less of or care more of? Uh, I'm going to picture in picture here so I can reference that one. Let's go to, uh, give me a picture in picture, just so that's on the screen here. We, I'm sure all of you have these types of stories, and I'm sure some of you want, you can go ahead and type some of those into chats. It's it's nice to have them in the chat. Um, but if I can go back right now and tell myself when I was starting out, what would be the secret sauce to me is just forget about making money. I, it, 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 I was consumed with making money early on in this, and that was just overwhelmed me. It's all I wanted to do. All I could think about is how I'm going to spend my millions as a day trader. And I got my ass handed to me, to be honest. You know, it was, it was, I was so focused on quote unquote crossing the street, I forgot to look both ways. And, you know, you can look at making money, but to me, making money is the, the mistake. Making money is a byproduct of not losing it. And if I were to go back right now, I'd say my main focus every day should have been don't lose money. Now, of course, we're going to lose money as traders, period. I don't care who you are, you are going to lose money. It happens, it's a guaranteed part of this profession. The key is just not losing more than you tell yourself you want to lose. So if you come up with your number, and my number back in the day, uh, once I finally started to put the brakes on and show some semblance of discipline and money management, was $500 a day. 500 bucks a day. Hey, Gerald, you're right there. I think I might be the first time I saw you comment in here, Gerald. So welcome to the show. Um, you stop limits, stay disciplined. Well, that's okay. That's a great point there, but it's it's dangerous to use a stop limit. And if you're talking about uh, an order, a stop limit order is very dangerous, actually. You may never get out. But if you're talking about a stop limit on your personal account as far as how much you're going to lose, 100%. Yes. Um, everybody's number will be different. And I know I've done this on this program before where I said I challenge everybody here to write down a number per day that you are comfortable losing. Yes, not one of us wants to lose, but there has to be a number that you say, I could lose X and still be okay for the day. Uh, I won't throw anything around like I did last time, but the last time I referenced this, you know, I, I told you, I lose 500 bucks in a day, that's fine. No big deal, it's just part of the game. If I lose 5,000, you know, now I'm a different person. I'm, I'm psychologically damaged. I might actually try to revenge trade. You can't, you can't let it get to that point. And everybody's number will be different. Now, maybe you're completely desensitized to money and let's say you've got a $50,000 account and you say, oh, I'll lose 50,000 a day. No, that doesn't work. It needs to be something smaller 
so you know that you can live to fight another day, right? You know, so it's, as they said in Monty Python, tis just a flesh wound. Well, I'll take a small little flesh wound over, you know, a decapitation in the financial markets because you're not coming back from that one. So I would say if I could go back in time and tell myself something and be like, forget about making money, forget it. It will take care of itself over time as long as you focus on the losses. Um, with that, you can start to refine your strategy. You start to your journaling so you see what you're doing right, what you're doing wrong, and always reviewing and revising that process. Um, the second part of that says, what could you, or to care less of, care less about what people say. Care less about the pundits on TV. Kind of ironic that here I am, I guess you could say I'm somewhat of a pundit. Uh, you could say, ignore everything I say. I, I don't think you should ignore it. I mean, look, sometimes I'll go through a subject and I might give you some food for thought. I might give you a perspective on analysis on a security that you look at and you go, ooh, that is an interesting one. Let me look at that one tomorrow and make my own assessments. Um, you know, last couple of shows, I've been kind of walking through some scenarios and trade setups that I might be interested in or might be looking at. Um, you know, that's that's for you to decide if you want to be make, taking those trades or not. Uh, generally, when I see somebody on a CNBC or Fox or a Bloomberg, my personal feeling is that they are going to be saying something that will benefit them and them only. I think that that's wrong. And you know, now they're showing you, oh, this person in small print, they hold the stock. Yeah, of course they're gonna. If I owned, um, you know, let's say fifty thousand shares of stock X Y Z, and I got on CNBC and I work for one of these firms, I will tell you the rosiest picture about stock X Y Z because I need you to buy it. I need to convince you. So ignore these talking heads on TV. Um, if you watch that stuff, including this show. Use it as educational purposes. Maybe it gives you some trade ideas, but you don't need to be following everything I'm doing. Uh, I'm probably far more transparent than anybody on those networks, which is probably why I will never be on the networks. And I'd rather be that transparent. You know, I'm in trades. I'll tell you if I'm in trades. I'll tell you what I'm doing and what I'm thinking. Um, I'm not going to front run orders and tell you, you know, to make a trade and I try to jump in before you. Uh, to me, that's just wrong. So I'll map out my trades. If I find good stuff, I'll, I'll share those with you. But um, to me, that's it. You really got to make sure that you have uh, stop losses in place and downside. Um, Brendan says, simulators are your best friend. I regret not using them more fully. Oh, I have a problem with that. A simulator to me... All right, let's go back to the crude example. Um, let's assume it's like... <laughs> let's see if I get in trouble on this one. It's like saying... You want to be intimate with somebody else. You got a significant other. You want to be intimate. Well, you could read, you know, a Playboy magazine all you want and learn about intimacy. That's probably not going to help you when you actually get down to the real thing. Simulators are great from my perspective for one thing, and that is to understand the platform, the mechanics of sending out orders, putting in stops, and trading and charting all that stuff. As far as understanding those results being real, it's totally not real. Some platforms will fill you at any price that you put in, so it's false. I would rather you start with a small account since shares of stock are uh, commission free right now for almost every platform. Start off with a small account and just trade very small share size and equities till you start to get some, some results. But I would say get in the market, get real skin in the game because uh, simulators do things very differently than real markets. It just doesn't work the same. Uh, yeah, it doesn't sting, right? But you also don't get that same emotion. And to me, emotions are one of the hardest things can, to control. The sweaty palms, I'm sure you guys have all had that. You've been in a really big position, your palms start to sweat, you get nervous, you do the, what I call the catatonic rock where you're doing this one and you're just sitting there watching your screen. You don't do that in simulator because you don't care. It's like, ah, it's simulator, who cares? You know, you have a real big loss, what do you do? You just turn off the computer and all of a sudden your trades are back to normal. Oh, okay, I don't know. To me, simulator isn't that great. All right, cool. Um, <laughs> and I agree. Brennan says, I learned without simulators, I like them for refining strategies. Cool. And, and I think that that's good. I do think to help you, but don't get lulled into believing that those results are the actual real results. All right, let me go from there. Uh, I think I need to go and do some wrap up here today. So let me go and see what I got for tomorrow. This is, uh, this is what we've got cooking for tomorrow. Um, 
not a lot of great stuff. You just have crude oil inventories for the US. Uh, what was noteworthy was actually what happened today. So here is what we've got for tomorrow. You can see British Pound is their 30 year bond auction, you have IFO business climate for the Euro. Really, the major stuff is HPI and crude oil inventories for the US. Now I will show you just real quick what happened today with regards to um, our markets. Let me bring up the results here. I thought this was interesting. You look at the, the red box here, new home sales were significantly higher than expected, which is a very good sign. That means that there is transactions and money flow going on. The Richmond Manufacturing Index was no surprise either. We saw the, uh, the Philadelphia, we saw the New York Empire State Manufacturing Index all come out with just glowing numbers. So nice to see the turnaround in that one. Uh, the services PMI and flash services, uh, manufacturing and services PMI was a little bit of a surprise. I actually thought that they would be better than this. Um, they're still showing contraction with regards to services and manufacturing purchasing managers index. So that is your announcements for tomorrow. All in all, not a lot to speak of there um, on the economic front. So hopefully uh, there's something out there for you with uh, regards to what happens in these markets. Let's see if I got any last minute questions here. Um, the rubber ducky, huh? Oh, yeah, okay, cool. Everyone seems to like the rubber ducky. Well, maybe I'll have to get Tim back on the program here soon and we'll talk more about that rubber ducky. All right, that will do it for me, everybody. Hope you guys enjoyed today's show. If you did, give me a little like on that one. Uh, thumbs up always helps this program. If you have questions, feel free to send those on in at TraderMerlin.com. That's the easiest way to send questions directly to me. If you have something that you don't want me to disclose on air, then just say, hey, don't talk about this one on air. I usually don't say people's last names, so that's... Uh, that's an easy one for me, but uh, send in your comments and questions at TraderMerlin.com or you can put them down below the video, down below the YouTube chat. Um, our guest for tomorrow is going to be Sam Evans. So we'll have Sam Evans on Wednesday. He's got an announcement to make too about some new endeavor he's doing. I'm also going to have Tilly Allison back on the program on Thursday just to talk about um, the video that she puts out on Sunday. I think some of you guys saw that, her levels. I actually really enjoyed it. Uh, helping her put that together because there were some great levels done. I, I think it was actually really well designed and I think it's a great piece. So I'm gonna actually ask her some of the viewer questions we're asking about different time frames she uses. So we'll do uh, kind of a Q&A about her analysis on the Sunday edition, which will now be a, hopefully a staple of this program going forward. That will do it for today, everybody. Hope you have a fantastic day out there. I'm assuming you'll see a little more volatility tomorrow and maybe hopefully some more directions. We'll see you tomorrow. Take care.